So hello and happy Friday. Welcome. This is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers episode number 100. So thank you for being here. If you've been watching all these episodes up until now, thank you so much. I hope they continue to be helpful to you. It's Friday, March the 5th. And what else is going on? If uh, you'd like to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description. There is going to be a giveaway, but I'm not telling you the terms of the giveaway yet. You're going to have to watch and figure it out. I'll explain it later. And because people wanted me to do something special for the 100th episode, so kind of going to do the normal things, I guess. But I'm glad you're here, glad you're watching. And uh, all the questions we're talking about are listed down below. And if you'd like to join us in a Way to Be Fellowship, there's a link to that also where you can get your questions answered. You have to be on Facebook to use it. We went over a milestone there, over a thousand members. So thank you for joining that. The discussions are fantastic. People are staying friendly and helpful to each other, which is the whole purpose. And a shout out to the perfect, perfect, well, above average moderators there. So everything's going great. And uh, this is also a podcast on Podbean. So that's pretty much it. This is the way to be. So let's get started. Question number one from Kathy W. My bees are in two to eight frame deep boxes for winter. All my hives, eight, have sensors in them. Three of my hives are very strong. The sensor reading could tell their movement and strength. I had one similarly strong hive last spring that I had to split one to three. So from one colony into three splits. I don't want more hives. I just plan to give them more room early by adding a honey super in March instead of splitting them. They have candy boards on them, but I don't want to take that away just in case they may still need the sugar. Would the bees move sugar from the candy board to the honey super? Would the bees swarm anyway, even if they have plenty of room? Those are all great questions. And let me tell you about bees, because that's what we're talking about here. That's the whole point. Um, we can do everything by the book, and the bees will still do things on their own. There's always some exception to the general rule. So what we talk about here are statistically the things that work most often. So the first thing I'll address here is candy board. So if you've got fondant, or if you've got a sugar brick, or if you've got dry sugar, on top of your hive as an emergency resource for the warming up days that are bound to happen if they aren't happening already where you are, then will the bees use that and store it in their honey supers? Highly unlikely. What we do know is that sugar syrup in the fall for those desperate colonies, that is a two to one by weight ratio. Two parts sugar, one part water. The bees do tend to take that syrup and store that. How do we know that? Because the hives gain weight while that's on. And uh, But when it comes to dry sugar, the emergency feed and resources like that, you know, the bees are just using that because it happens to be available and they're desperate for it. It means that they've run out of their other resources like stored capped honey, which is what we all hope to leave on for them to get through winter. So if we've done the right thing, depending on where you live, I'm in the northeastern United States, state of Pennsylvania, it gets cold here, stays cold. As you saw in the opening, it's wicked cold here. The uh, bees need a lot of capped honey stored to get through winter. The other part of that is, of course, stored pollen. But when the pollen flow kicks in and they start bringing that on board, what do they need? What do bees need to satisfy their biology inside the hive. They need water. Every living thing needs water. They get that in a form of condensation this time of year in my hives. They also need a carbohydrate. They need an energy source. They need the high sugar that comes with stored honey. They also need proteins. That's the third thing. The proteins come in the form of pollen. And those pollen proteins get broken down and uh, turn into what's known as bee bread after fermentation. And then the bees seal that up a little bit. That's why when you look in there, your pollen packs that have been there for a while are shiny and surfaced. 
And there you have it. That's what the bees need. And that's what they're going to be feeding the new developing larvae if the queen is in lay. And she probably is this time of year, no matter where you are. So they're starting to build up. Now, so all those resources are on there. And I leave 50, 60 to 100 pounds of honey on. And hopefully they come out with a bunch of surplus. This year, it's anybody's guess, but I did tip a few of the hives recently, and they're heavy. They're still loaded with honey. Great news. The other thing is I have nine hives with sensors. So now I know what the humidity levels are and what the temperature levels are. How do I know if the bees are alive? If it's nighttime and it's 17 degrees outside and I look at the sensors, which you saw on the opening sequence here, little individual sensor screens, which by the way are somewhat addicting. You can see that they're alive because those colonies at the feeder, which is on the very top, so that's not even where the cluster is. They are a good eight to 10 degrees warmer than the outside air. So the only thing that could be providing heat at nighttime has to be living bees. So we know they're alive. So here's the thing. Uh, how do we keep them from swarming? So you don't want more colonies. You have to expand the colony space available to those bees ahead of time. How much ahead? So if you had a deep brood box and you went through winter with a deep brood box and a medium honey super. And of course, the, the most common circumstance is that they've gone from the brood box up into that medium super. Hopefully there's an inner cover there that they've encountered. And hopefully on top of that inner cover is a feeder shim for emergency purposes. Not all of them will need it. And an insulated cover. So minimum. Now, Spring hits and they start expanding pretty fast. So there's a population explosion. So they start to fill the, the frames. So if it's a 10 frame box and eight of them are full of bees, seven of them are full of bees, it's time to think about putting a super back on because we've condensed our colonies down in winter. I don't rotate the bottom boxes. I don't trade them out. I let the cluster remain where it is. I don't like to disturb the cluster in spring. And as they build up, as that traffic continues, and when we see more than 10 loads of pollen per minute coming through that landing board, they're kicking in and it's time to put another box on there, another medium generally. For flow hive keepers, you'll be putting your flow super on once they fill that second box again, but they gain weight rapidly in spring. Physical weight from the number of bees, and then of course material storage in the form of nectar, which turns into honey. And then you also have the pollen, which doesn't weigh a pile. But uh, that's it. The number of bees you want to expand ahead of time. Now, let's say we did that. If you've got a winter tight entrance, you can also open that up a little bit in spring. That's a question that I get a lot is how often or when do I open up my entrance reducer? Well, if there's no traffic jam, if the bees are going in and out without there being a waiting line without them all being clustered, trying to get through while the bees are trying to get out. That's your good sign to open it up a little bit. But if they're getting in and out nice and easy and they're passing each other up and the guard bees are there, they're able to do their thing, then the opening is large enough. In my opinion, remember, all of these answers are opinions often supported by scientific research or my own personal background. So there you have it. You can expand like that ahead of them. Here's the other thing. When you start to see them doing things like making queen cups, a queen cup, by the way, is a little, it looks like the cap on an acorn, just, you know, roughly. And uh, it'll generally be pointed down and it has nothing in it. It's a cup. It's a, it's a house without a resident. So then what happens is if they decide that they're going to split on their own, that's a swarm. So they do that likely in spring. That's their natural biology. So what are we doing? We're fighting their natural instinct. We're working against their urge to reproduce as a superorganism. So we do that by taking away those triggers that incite them to create new queens and to get rid of the old queen within spring a huge percentage of the workforce in that colony. So the triggers are that the numbers are building, the cavity space does not support the numbers. So we have to expand the cavity space so that as they expand their numbers, they still have places to put resources and they have places physically for the bees to occupy inside the hive. Now, when we 
once, and that's why I mentioned the queen cup. Once they start to make a queen cell, what's the difference between a queen cup and a queen cell? The presence of an egg. And then after three days, that egg hatches. Now we have a larva. And if it's in a queen, if it's in a queen cup, then it becomes a queen cell now, and it's being fed after that third day, and the pheromones start to come out. This has an impact on the response of the bees. They are making preparations now to replace their queen. They may even be inspired to no longer feed the queen as much as they used to. They may push her off of lay. They may chase her around in the colony while she starts to lose weight because guess what? A fully fertile, fully in lay queen can't do very well. That's fly. So all of these things start to go on and it's your job if you're trying to keep them and you don't want them to swarm, you have to make your preps and your alterations ahead of those events. So you do that opening the landing board up a little bit if it's congested also expanding by adding physical space but pre-drawn cells are the biggest benefit in other words if you just put a bunch of foundationless frames in a box on top of a colony that's in the spring that looks like it's about to make preparations to get underway and the cells are not drawn out they are less inclined to go ahead and build the wax out and work that because they're already going to get out of there so you see a cessation of work. Now, if you did something like put a few, if, if you saved your combs and you froze them in the winter and you did all the right things and, and their colony, their combs left over from the previous year and then from that same colony, number one, the best, put those drawn frames in to that medium box and right on top there. Now they have immediate stores and resources to put their stuff and it's another step towards helping them decide to stay put. You can do all of that and they can still swarm. But those are the things you would do. If you don't want your queen to get away and you don't want them to go too far, you can clip one set of her wings about halfway down. That will keep her around and when she does fly out, it won't keep her from flying out, but when she does, you'll be able to harvest that swarm of bees and rehive them in another box. But the goal here is not to have any more boxes. The other thing is, uh, these are in small boxes. I would, see, I don't use breeding nukes, nucleus colonies. I don't use the three frame or the two frame or the five frame temporary residences. And the reason I don't do that is because I forget. I forget to attend to them. Uh, their population grows too fast. They outgrow that tiny space. And next thing you know, you have a tiny swarm. Worse than that, they abscond and you lose them all together. What's the difference between swarming and absconding? Well, when they abscond, they've decided the space is too small, but rather than split and make a new colony, the existing colony in that tiny residence can depart wholesale and leave it empty. So what I do is I always put them in a full size eight frame brood box or a 10 frame brood box and I leave those outer frames in there. I don't put blank frames in. I don't put insulation boards in to reduce the space and pull them out later. Some people do that. And what we're onto here is a difference in practical applications of bee management. I know that these things can happen too fast for me to keep up with them. And that's embarrassing because I'm not a commercial beekeeper. I only have, a, like last year, I maxed out at 20 colonies, and then it went down to 19. So I can't even keep up with that. If I start to mess with smaller boxes and things that require more frequent attention, the populations get out of hand. So I like to set them up in a final residence right off the bat. Eight frame brood box or a 10 frame brood box, fully encapsulated, ready to go. And then that's what I personally do. So, next question, M. Lathan. I'm a returning beekeeper, thoroughly sticker shocked by today's prices. I have questions which I am hoping will fit your regime. Number one, weight is a concern for me. Do you have thoughts on going solely eight frames? Number two, any ideas on screening two hives to hide from my village neighbors? Three, how can one keep and maintain only two hives? Thanks. Okay, now this is interesting. And I think this person actually wrote me again trying to clarify to make sure I understood what the question is. But there are 
people keeping bees in residential areas, urban areas. And there are homeowners associations and there are ordinances that prevent them from, if they can have bees, prevent them from having an entire apiary in their yard of 10 or 11 colonies. So here what we're talking about is a limit of two. And it's interesting because there is a guy that did a YouTube, uh, I believe if you're researching horizontal hives, the long lang in particular, he got into trouble with his neighbors and I did watch his video and I did make a comment there and he decided to hide his bees. So he built a shed and he put his long Langstroth hive inside the shed and they had a tube going from it out. So now it just looks like a normal shed and he could disguise the entrance. Now I'm not helping you get around any rules or regulations or dealing with people that are in charge of your area or I'm not encouraging you to violate any of your ordinances. But I am telling you how, let's say you had nosy neighbors who don't like bees and you just want to uh, disguise the fact that you have a bunch of them. A long Langstroth hive, to me, this ties into two things. One is not wanting to lift, okay? So if you're tired of picking up boxes and you only want to lift individual frames, the long Langstroth horizontal beehive configuration is an outstanding choice. It is the easiest to manage beehive I have ever owned of any kind. No lifting. Now, the original box itself, if you build it super thick the way I did, all the side walls are thick, everything is inch and a half thick or better, uh, that thing's heavy. But that's the beauty of it. It's stationary. You don't have to do anything with it. I don't have to pick it up. So you set it where you want it. And this is my advice here would be uh, go horizontal. Here's another thing that I think about. There's no limit to how long that thing could be. For, to anybody else, it just looks like a big coffin in your yard. But that thing could, hire, could house three colonies of bees with partitions. You know, on this end, you've got a colony of bees. In the middle, you've got a colony of bees with divider boards. And then at the very end, you've got another colony of bees. And you've got an entrance going that way, entrance that way at that end, and an entrance straight out the front. And then you've got this communal resource of the warming that goes on inside that hive. Uh, so they benefit one another. Now we've got three hives together. So this is unique. Now, obviously, if you live in the country or you have the space, the farther apart your beehives are, the better for them. Less bee drift, less sharing of pathogens and things like that. But let's go past that. We're not dealing with that. We're talking about somebody who has a tiny space in suburbia. So if I wanted to keep more than the two, assuming it's allowed, I would have one really long hive and put several colonies within that same structure. And then the lifting, as I mentioned before, is easy. It's frame by frame. Or get a really nice shed and you can put your hives inside the shed and then you just have entrances. You could put a full-size vertical Langstroth hive, but then you're back to lifting, so I like the horizontals. And then just have your inch and a half tubes leading out and have little porches for your bees where they enter in and out. You don't have a bunch of individual colonies for somebody to drive by and go, ooh, I think uh, Mr. M over here has too many colonies. We need to turn that in. So a nice hedge around them evergreen of course so it doesn't disclose where they are in the winter time or a nice stockade fence so your bees fly up and over and they're not in the flyway and nobody knows exactly how many colonies you have so that's what i would do but look for this video on this guy it's a uh, long length so if i can find it i'll put the link down in the video description but he did uh, exactly that he was in trouble with his neighbors and uh he wanted more beehives and he did a lot of configurations. The problem with that YouTube channel is, and this happens so often, somebody's doing something interesting and they say, and then I'll show you the follow-up in my next video. And then this video is a couple of years old and there was no follow-up and they don't answer questions. Super frustrating. So we don't get to know how it went if he avoided his neighbors or anything else. But that's my advice on that one. Here we go with a really big question here. <clears throat> Very important. This is from Ned, and it doesn't say where he's from, but it says, Greetings, Fred. I'm a 70-year-old novice beekeeper and a student 
in the Oregon State University Master Beekeeper Program. Fantastic. I hope you're doing really well in that program that you're learning piles. I have to do two double deep hives with top feeders so far that so far have survived the frost, ice, and light snow of winter. During the last year, I was stung on my hands about 25 times without incident, and within half an hour of each sting, the sting sites were not detectable. So we had some good uh, resistance there. Then on November 28th, I was stung on the ankle and had an anaphylactic reaction that required emergency hospitalization and included a respiratory failure. I now have neuropathy in the leg that was stung and I require oxygen during the night. Initially, the allergy specialist said I should be tested four to six weeks after the sting for wasp and bee venom sensitivity. So that specific allergy treatments could commence to slowly reduce my venom sensitivity. However, when the four to six week window passed, the allergy specialist said there were not any tests or treatment resources available because of the COVID pandemic. The allergy specialist emphasized that my next bee sting will result in a more severe reaction and is likely to be fatal. Since the bee sting on November 28th, I have suited up twice with the addition of spats to cover my ankles while I serviced the top feeders. Knowing that a single sting can be fatal truly changes the beekeeping experience and makes it very stressful. Reducing my risk of a bee sting is not as simple as getting rid of my bees. My next door neighbor has six hives within 100 feet of my hive, so his bees heavily visit my property, which has an abundance of flowering plants and wildflowers intended for the honeybees. I have extensive gardens with an artichoke patch, an asparagus patch, and a wine grape vineyard, so I spend most of my time outside tilling, composting, and surrounded by honeybees, bumblebees, and my harmless mason bees, paper wasps, mud wasps, and occasional yellow jackets. So the sting risk is ever present and wearing a bee suit at all times outside, not particularly desirable or practical. I will definitely keep the bees through March to complete the over winter challenge for the OSU Master Beekeeper Program purposes. So have a dilemma, your thoughts, please. This is Ned and uh, yeah, in Oregon. So anyway, this actually comes up a lot and I don't know if you're gonna like my answer, but I understand the investment of being in a master beekeeper program and committing all that time to studies and research. Now you're at the practical end of it and you have to demonstrate all of these abilities of manipulating the bees and competency with bees and things like that. So there's a press to do that, but guess what's going on here? Your life is at risk. So, and I see the justification. Well, if I wasn't keeping bees, they'd still be coming to my property because I have all this floral, all these resources that the bees come to. So, and my neighbor's over there and he's got bees too. Well, bees visiting your property while foraging is very different from actually managing and getting into your own hives. Your chances of being stung while working your own bees, opening the hives, getting into the brood and everything else that you have to do when you're managing bees opens you up to more opportunities to be stung. Bees that are foraging, that are out on your plants, in your gardens, in the meadows, on the flowers, on the trees, all these different things, those bees are in the most passive possible state. In fact, unless you're running barefoot through a field of clover, your chance, and you step on a bee that happens to be on clover, your chances of being stung are almost not at all. I have never been stung just walking into the vicinity of a bee tree or photographing and videoing bees as they go from flower to flower and things like that in very close context. There's no reason in that environment to even wear any protection because your chances of being stung are almost non-existent. So this justification, I understand, this justification that I'm around bees all the time anyway, I'm at risk of being stung, very different. And I can tell you this, if I were in jeopardy of losing my life and going into anaphylactic shock and being a medical emergency, especially out where I live, where who knows how long it takes a, an ambulance to come and get you and assuming that you make it that far, why take the risk? Why risk human life 
If some, if any member of my family were allergic to that degree, we would stop beekeeping. I just would not keep bees. That's my advice. I would not keep bees. And it's a ripoff if you want to be a master beekeeper because your job as a master beekeeper is to educate people and teach about bees. And of course, competency in managing bees is what a master beekeeper needs to be able to do. I get it. It's, it's a ripoff. Here's the thing. My grandmother in Chester, Vermont, many, many years ago, kept bees. She had fantastic bees. And in a beautiful area, Chester, Vermont had lots of, you know, unbothered, landscape for the bees to forage on. My grandfather, who was a minister in that town, would get stung by bees. And, you know, they believe the whole story that, you know, you get stung by bees and that's maintenance. That's, you'll build resistance. You'll build a resistance to venom. So you're basically getting inoculated against bee stings and you're not going to react anymore. Much as described here, gets stung a whole bunch of times, swells up a little, goes away right away instead of the normal two days or whatever that it takes some people for a sting swelling to go away. But uh, he actually went the other way and he developed a heightened sensitivity to bee venom. So much like this, used to being stung, no big deal, sensitivity now. And then the doctor said the next time he gets stung, it could be his last. So my grandmother had to stop keeping bees because my grandfather was in proximity to her working apiary there in Chester, Vermont. So she decided to hang everything up right then and there, get rid of all the bees, stop keeping bees just because of the risk to life and limb. So same advice to you. Unfortunately, I would find something else to do and I would not keep bees if my life or one of my family members were that allergic to bees. I'm sorry to say. Next question comes from Rachel Stone. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I got my first colony in February of 2020, late summer in Australia as a four frame nuke. And due to my lack of knowledge, I only managed to fill a single 10 frame deep on natural resources before winter set in. But considering the flow guys, work out of single deeps at the University of Guelph, G-U-E-L-P-H, I don't know how to pronounce it, Guelph. Also recommend this, I thought, okay, this will work. Got them through winter fine with some sugar brick supplements and all looked great going into spring, but in Western Australia this year, we somehow managed to miss out on a spring nectar flow and went straight into summer dearth. For those of you who don't know, a summer dearth, any dearth period, is when the environment is not providing what your bees need. Colony starvation has been a major issue for hobby and commercial beekeepers alike, with one commercial operation reporting losses of 30% of his breeding nukes, despite feeding. I caught one of my colonies on the brink of starvation and fed them for a couple of weeks, and they are now enjoying the autumn flow. So... I've decided to put a medium on all of my colonies, after all, not just about winter stores. Being a new beekeeper, I don't have boxes of stickies, so I have treated them all to a full medium depth box of better comb with only three colonies I can afford to make it easier for them. One colony is easy forced absconded forced abscond still building up so added on top as usual but the other two i had optimistically put the flow supers on before we knew it was going to be such a i think it's crap season because it says c and then a bunch of deals lined up yesterday i put the medium between the brood box and the flow hive super i had intended to check the frames in the flow hive super and harvest any that were suitable before giving myself a hernia, lifting it, but forgot to take the gear. So am now considering swapping all to eight frame box kits. I might harvest before lifting today and I visit the second colony. Both of these are outsourced to other friends' properties. Question number one. Should I leave this one alone for a couple of weeks to let them finish off the flow hive super? These are flow hives, by the way, in the background and get well into filling the medium, which will hopefully mean I can harvest the entire flow hive super, not meaning to sound greedy, 
Just trying to reduce the second potential problem I have. Question number two is, can you have the flow hive super on the colony, but with the frames in the open drain position so they can move the leftovers down into the medium? It is technically illegal here to leave a hive super in the open for bees to rob out to take back to the hive. Risk of spreading disease such as American fowl brood if present to other colonies that would join the robbing party. Plus, if I can leave it on for them to rearrange their stores, they get it all rather than losing some of their colonies. Well, I'm going to answer question number two right now. It is not good to leave the flow hive super on. Those are the mechanized plastic frames that when you activate them, they split like this. The honey drains out, goes into a trough, comes out, and you harvest. Now the question is, can I leave them as closed frames, but then open it so it stays in the drain position so then the bees could keep it cleaned out and they would not fill the cells because it would be continuing to drain. That does not work because the way it's designed, once the cells are in that position, they can't actively get in to do a full detailed job on cleaning up that flow super. It must be returned to its full closed hexacell configuration so the bees can work it. So that doesn't work to just leave it open. So I would drain it, take it off, but drain it, close it, let the bees clean it up for a day or two, then take it off and leave them with that deep bottom box and that medium super to build their winter resources. The next question three, if I can leave it on in drain position, would they clean and remove residue in the medium box better? If I then move the medium to the top of the flow hive super, or would this leave too large a void between the brood box? No, don't do that. I would. So the question is, can I leave my brood box at the bottom, take that medium super, swap it with the flow super, that thing right back there, and put the medium on top of that, and then the bees travel through to do their cleanup and stuff like that. I would not do that. I would let them clean out the flow super, remove it for winter, leave the deep and the medium on for them to continue to store resources that they're going to need going into winter down there while we are going into summer. Those are my ideas. But the flow supers just simply do not uh, work like that. The bees don't have access when it's left in the open position to drain it completely. So here's the next question from Harvey. OAV treatments. Well, Fred, the EPA has finally come to their senses and approved OAV, OAV for those of you who don't know, oxalic acid vaporization. It's something that here in the United States was only within the past several years approved for use as a varroa destructor miticide. Now it has been approved to be used when flow, flow. So when honey supers are on. So because before you couldn't. So anyway, uh, I know you have been advocating this for years, especially since parts of Europe have been treating with supers on for a long time. And so here's the thing, Harvey Schumann. So here's the thing, and a lot of people wrote right away as soon as that got approved and started, did you hear, do you know, oxalic acid vaporization is approved and everything else. Well, let's talk about the reason that it was approved, first of all, is um, because there's almost no difference in the oxalis. And it's, it is ubiquitous. It is in almost every plant in your garden. It is in the things that you're eating all the time. So it was always something that I wanted to get tested because what does it change for me? Almost nothing personally for me because when you do, there are a lot of delivery methods for oxalic acid. It is considered a soft acid. It's designed to kill off your varroa mites when they need it, not just prophylactically to hit every hive you have because it's oxalic and it's easy and everything else. You still need to follow the procedure. You still need to follow the methods and the dosing and everything else and the periodicity. One of the things that worked against people was um, if you were going into spring and you were about to put your honey supers on, if you treat in early spring, like, like this time of year, let's say, if you knew that you had a mite problem and you're going to treat with oxalic, uh, it works best when you have your lowest brood numbers, and that's because it only works on phoretic mites. What's a phoretic mite? A mite that's exposed, a mite that's not in a capped pupa cell. So only the mites that are exposed get affected by it. 
It settles as a micro dust on every surface on the ins inside of the hive. So I made a video and showed you what it does inside the observation hive and it just goes everywhere and settles on the bees and everything else and the bees clean it off. Then the mites get killed by it. The problem was there was a, you know, as Randy Oliver said in a recent Zoom meeting that we had with my beekeeping association, and I quote, he said, treatment with oxalic acid vaporization during summer is illegal. And that was the end of the discussion. Well, why would they say that? Well, it's illegal because you can't have your honey supers on. Now, of course, it was the honor system because who really would know if you treated with oxalic acid vaporization and you had honey supers on? That residue would settle on the capped honey, on the surface of the honey and everything else. Every tested piece of every tested sample of honey, whether somebody treated with oxalic acid vaporization or not, had oxalic acid in it. Why? Because all the plants had it. So I wanted to send off samples to get them to do a test. I wanted to do honey samples, open and capped. And uh, open, of course, being those are the cells that are not yet capped that are full of honey that hasn't dried out enough to be capped. I wanted to see what gets picked up in that before treatment. So no exposure to the oxalic as a treatment. And then of course, after treatment, collect samples and then let's get them to a lab and get them tested. None of the labs had protocols for that. Why? Because they said it was not a concern to the FDA. So that's interesting because in other words, even if it had been present, it wouldn't be at the level necessary to ring alarm bells. But so now here we are, free and clear, you can use it. But here's the concern is that people will, of course, well now it's totally, wow, it's safe for everything. Let's just treat, treat, treat. Let's just do, just, just treat all the time. Why not? It can stress the bees. It can show negative aspects to the bees. Uh, don't just use it and go nuts with it. One of the concerns before was, once you treated, you actually had a withdrawal period. You could not put honey supers on for 14 days after you did an oxalic acid vaporization treatment, or after you did dribble, or after you sprayed them. Uh, so now that's the benefit, in my opinion. You don't have to wait that 14 days. So you can do the treatment. Legally now, you can treat with your supers on. But uh, to me, the big thing is you don't have to wait because two weeks in spring when a nectar flow comes on and you just treat it with oxalic, you got to wait two weeks and everything's going crazy and that colony is filling up and it ties into these things before we can push them to swarming if we don't expand the colony quick enough and get the honey supers on. So now legally you can do it. So here's the other thing that you need to think about, though. That is a United States uh, Department of Agriculture uh, approval as a miticide, but your individual state still may not allow it. So you got to find out with your state department of agriculture, they're the ones that control all pesticides and a miticide is a pesticide. So you have to also check in with your state department of agriculture to see if it's clear for there because the OIV has been, the oxalic acid has been approved nationwide, but of course states, counties, and things like that can tighten their restrictions and regulations. So you still need to check in on it. But yes, I know it is green lighted, which by the way, I only started using it a couple of years ago, but the, the positive effect was so good. But uh, personally, what do I recommend now? That you only use oxalic acid vaporization as a treatment in the winter time when the brood is at its minimum. So the fewer brood present, the more effective it is because it's going to affect phoretic mites. Those mites that are exposed, when are they exposed? Most of them are exposed during winter and it can take those mites the entire rest of the summer to get their numbers back to what they were in the fall. And mite numbers increase rapidly when the numbers of bees are increasing rapidly because those mites need to use those capped pupa cells especially drones, because they have the longest pupa period, uh, that's where they do the reproducing. But if you only have a tiny number of mites going into spring because you treat it in the wintertime when there was no brood, then now if you start up with four or five mites and if they double every time there's a brood cycle, they still don't get the numbers huge. Partner that with bees that can handle them 
and you're actually controlling the mites extremely well that way. You may not have to do any other treatments. Count your mites to be sure. Next one comes from Sail Ninja. Can I add a bee weaver queen to a package of Russian or Corniolan bees I ordered from another source? If I have the bees shipped without a queen, will that satisfy the time the bees need to be queenless in order to accept the new queen? Is there a different process of introduction since the packages haven't been shipped with her? Will the bees just fly away? There's a lot going on in this question, actually, for such a short question. And I have to tell you, one of the things I don't like right off the bat, can I add a bee weaver queen to a package of Russian or Carniolan bees? If you're coming with a Russian or Carniolan queen, those bees are known to do well against Varroa. So bringing in a bee weaver queen may not necessarily be an upgrade. So that's the other part. If you're already getting Russian bees, stay with your Russians. Those things will handle Varroa extremely well. That's my guess. So I don't know, you know, we're not necessarily getting a big gain. If you had Italians coming in and now you're going to swap out a bee weaver queen for one of those, okay, I can see the improvement when it comes to control of Varroa. But uh, if you had these others, I would get those. So I wouldn't even swap out for the P. Weaver, to be honest. But uh, the other thing is when a package comes in, those bees already don't know the queen. That queen gets parked in a cage, she's mated, she's been banked or who knows what. Uh, that's when they keep a mated queen handy and ready to package and ship and they put some workers in there with her. But they also put this package of bees together. That package of bees, you don't know anything about those bees. It gets dumped in that package and you should really go and see uh, where package bees are being made, how they're treating the bees, where they're getting those workers and everything else. Because here's what they're doing. Uh, they're counting on the fact that uh, these are not their top quality bees, by the way, the bees that get dumped in the packages. Those are going to be the foragers that just hold the fort when you install them into your new hive, in your new location, and they're the ones that are going to help that queen uh, set up shop and it's her nurse bees that will be the ones that will be the most valuable and then you know the hierarchy continues from there as they progress but will they just take off they don't know where to go so even a package of bees that shows up with no queen whatsoever and you put them in a box and you put uh, frames in there and you have nectar resources for them they will still forage and likely return to that box unless there's another colony of bees around, and then they will just join forces with them. So that's not good, in my opinion, either. So you do have to have that queen around, and you do need to introduce her with them and uh, give them their three days. Now, when does the three-day period of getting acquainted happen? Well, you put the queen in her cage right in there with your new package of bees, and then they get used to her pheromone. They start to feed her and everything else, and then they chew through that sugar plug and she gets released and they start going from there. You know they're settled when they start building comb and everything else and building infrastructure to support that queen because her pheromone's present and they instinctively anchor around that pheromone. In the absence of a queen, when a package just gets boxed up or the queen's not fertile or something like that, you could lose a lot of them due to drift. A recent study was done. Some colonies had up to 30 or 40 percent non-resident bees foragers in that colony. The drift numbers were incredible. Some people that are setting up these communal, you know, like you have a, a green space in a suburban area and everybody gets together and they all work the space together and it's usually partnered with some big organic garden or something and the beekeepers will have a chain link fence to protect their bees and then you'll see a row of 20 or 30 bee colonies in that chain link fence area. And some of the more savvy beekeepers will put their colony at the very ends of that, realizing that those are the colonies that pick up the most drift from foragers. Which foragers get let in to those colonies that they are not resident to? They are the foragers that are coming back loaded with pollen and nectar, so they're highly productive. They land on a stranger's front doorstep, but because they're bringing the goods, they get invited in, they stay. So it's kind of known that bee drift benefits those colonies that are at the bitter end 
of uh, long rows of colonies where they're all kept together. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, the bees have to get, they won't just fly away unless they have somewhere to go. So bees are kind of pragmatic like that and their instincts will keep them in that box together. Even though even the package of bees that you have might be composed of several other colonies, whoever shipped them, it's the honor system, what the quality of those bees are. So there you go. But yeah, if you're bringing in a weaver queen and you want queenless packages to put them in, she'll be fine. She will anchor them. But if you have access to Russians and other proven lines of bees, I would keep those. It's not necessarily a huge difference in how they're going to handle things. Next one is from Sunday Carradine. Fred, can you discuss about the green frame for mite control using drone larvae especially? If I'm not able to afford the oxalic acid yet, and I think what he means here, or Sunday, he or she, uh, oxalic acid itself is cheap. It's a delivery method that can run into money. The pan is about 40 or $50, depending on which one you get. You can go to the Blythewood Bee Company. They had one of the best pans price-wise that I found. And of course, the ProVap 110, which is super popular, costs just under about 500 bucks. So I know at some point you freeze the frame, killing the mites. If I did this, can I give that frame to my chickens to eat the larvae safely? This is what we're talking about. So whenever you see a green frame like this, why is it green? And it almost doesn't matter which company makes it. This one comes from Acorn, and this is triple waxed. And what you do is you put this in your number one and number two position normally. So at the end of your box, and this is in the brood box, and because these cell imprints are much larger than worker cells, when the bees draw them out, they follow that pattern on the bottom here, and they make the larger drone cells. So the good news is how many drones would there be in a colony on average? Super healthy colony, if there's a good drone population, it'll be about 20% of the population of the bees. So 20% of the productive brood cells might be committed to drone cells. The reason these things are bright green is so you don't ever confuse them with any other frame. And no matter what company makes them, Man Lake, Acorn, Beer Co., all the different companies that make these, uh, they're, they're still this green color. So one of the things you can do is, as described here, and I have chickens too, freerangechickens.org is one of my websites. So when you uh, put these in there and once they get to the cap phase, now this falls in line with the other discussion we had earlier. Why don't I do the small boxes? Well, I forget about them. So in a way, we're encouraging them to make more drones. Which colony do I want to make the most drones? Well, I want the most drones to survive for my top performing colonies because those are the genetics I want to send out into my region. Now, low performing colonies, you know, that you still find that they have high mite numbers and they still might require treatment. Those would be the ones that you want to get their drones out of that pool of genetics in your area because they're not handling those varroa mites. So one of the ways that we implement natural controls, that's what this is called. You put in these drone frames. So if you had a 10 frame box, how many drone frames would there be? Two. You put them right together. Like you don't have to put one at one end and one at the other. You can put them right together. And then when the drones get capped, this is the thing. You don't want to forget that it's happening. So you want to mark your calendar when you put it in there. And when they've drawn out the comb, when they've laid the eggs, and then you know that they're going to go into the pupa state. How long from the day they, the egg is laid to the time it gets into the pupa state? Well, the 10th day they're capped. From the time the egg is there to the time it spins its cocoon and is capped over. So now once it's capped over, you know, we know that the drones last the longest and they're the biggest. That's why Varroa destructor mites love to be in there because they have the most opportunity to reproduce and they have a lot of lipids. They have a lot of resources to feed on the fat body stores of that developing drone. So you want to pull it out before they're going to hatch, obviously, because the minute that drone hatches, you're also releasing the Varroa that developed with it. So... 
after they're capped and once the varroa mites are in there you don't have to wait because we're we have already trapped the reproductive mites there's no reason to wait for them to finish reproducing inside the drone cell because some people will say wait until the very end when they're about to hatch then grab them well that's the day you're going to find something else to do that's the day foul weather comes in and next thing you know they hatch out with their varroa destructor mites and all their new babies so what you want to do is as soon as they're capped go after them because the reproductive mites that are going to do that reproducing are already in there so get them now and yes take them out and feed them to your chickens here's what chickens do chickens are very very smart and they also are, are habit forming when it comes to feeding see this green color they see that color they come running if you've fed them drone frames before and you feed them in the same place every single time and you'll find that your chickens will run out and they'll eat so you don't even have to freeze them they'll eat that they'll pick the caps off they'll eat the larvae they'll eat the little mites with them and everything else well won't the mites get on the chickens no the mites are species specific so only bees so you're yes you can do that you can feed them and then as a precautionary uh, step after that go ahead and put them in the freezer but I don't freeze first I would feed them to the chickens then take the leftover frames and freeze them if you want to do that but this works it is part of natural varroa control and of course what I said before if you've got top performing colonies that are reducing the varroa numbers on their own they're biting their feet off you find them dead in the landing board you do a sugar shake or your alcohol wash whatever you do and you find out that the, the varroa destructor mite numbers are extremely low those are the ones you want them to hatch their drones you want them out that's the genetic material that we're sending out into the area flip side put these in the colonies that you had to treat that had high mite numbers use that as a natural method of control but don't let those drones go out and become the genetic stock because they're coming from queens that are not handling varroa mites very well so there i hope that's helpful next one comes from major combs is that a real name florence mississippi i have 56 acres of farmland 60 miles from my home there's a russian bee queen operation about nine tenths of a mile from this farm I'm planning on placing several swarm bait hives on this farm. If I catch some Russian swarms, should I bring these new colonies into my apiary with the Italian based crossed with Carniolans and Buckfast bees, or should I establish another bee yard for the Russians? Well, this is, this is in my opinion, contingent upon how many bees you have in your bee yard, how many colonies you have. Here's one of the things, you know, I was studying a lot last year about biosecurity in your apiary and everything else. And then I realized while I'm learning all of this that uh, I've been going out and catching swarms. I was all excited because I got a swarm from deep in the woods and way far away from me. And I brought it right in, put it right in a hive, right in my apiary. And what I'm doing is I'm bringing in unknown origin bees. I don't know what their genetics are. I don't know if they've already got mites on them. I don't know if they've got diseases. So, yes. If we're failing safe, if we're practicing biosecurity, then I have a satellite bee yard. Well, it's not a bee yard. It's, it's our son's yard. And uh, that's where I put swarm catches that are not for my own apiary. So it's one of my own colony of swarms and I catch it, I'll have it right there. If it's coming from somewhere else and I don't know about it, I would definitely set up another satellite bee yard. I would want that to be a mile or two away minimum the more the better but you're also yeah those are just not going to affect your focused apiary your best stock that's another thing that i recommend once you set up the satellite apiary where you're bringing in your raw unknown stuff if i had a colony of bees in my apiary apiary that had high varroa mite numbers and wasn't handling it would require more management or possible treatment for the mites those would also be in my satellite apiary and what I would keep in my focused top performing apiary would be only those bees that are handling for row destructor mites. That way you don't have to worry about drift between the colonies and stuff like that and the sharing of pathogens. So it's just my opinion. 
But uh, yeah, so how many bees are already in your apiary? Where do those come from? So I made a lot of mistakes. I was just mixing up all my bees, just thinking it's going to be great, and I'll just see who washes out in the end. But what I didn't realize was, and hadn't read the article about how many bees drift from one colony to another, it was another thing that uh, I was asking questions about myself, which is when you're treating with something like Formic Pro, the bees have a tendency to want to get out of that hive and pile on the front of it. Who, which colonies are you treating? You're treating the ones that have mite loads. Which colonies are you not treating? The ones that don't have mite loads. So those are your Darwinian bees. Those are the ones that are doing it on their own. And those are the ones that you want to work from. But if you've got in the same apiary, a colony that gets treated, and we've learned that now they can drift, they'll get pushed out when they're being treated with something like Formic Pro. What if they all migrate into your colony that was disease free or didn't have a big bromite problem and now all of a sudden it does. So that is my second layer. If I have a colony that is showing that it has a high mite load, it does not get to be in my prime apiary anymore. Because this year I'm not bringing in new stock, I'm only working with existing stock and I'm going to distill them based on their performance in managing mites on their own. Because my goal is to work exclusively from the stock that handles that well on their own. I'm not gonna hinder them by also putting stock in the same apiary that requires treatment. How's that sound? So here's the next one. Lance Douglas. Lance had a whole long list of things. But uh, one of the things was about this hive, wanting to know where I got my educational hive in here. And uh, these small hives that you can use when you're giving lectures about bees and stuff, uh, they come with the bottom board, two of these boxes, so you get your brood box and a super, and then of course you get your inner cover, and then you get the outer cover. He was interested in the queen excluder that came with it. Well, it didn't come with it. This was a full-size queen excluder. All I did was cut it down to match this so I could use it for training and discussion purposes. So that was a huge letdown, I'm sure for Lance to find out that it was just my own makeshift thing. But you can get them from Better Bee. They have education tools and things like that, and that's where you get that small colony. So they are super handy when you're teaching about bees. The second part here, I know you're not big on splitting your hives, but please share with us specifically how you handle extremely strong colonies and weak, struggling colonies. I'm referring to spring, summer months. That's handy because spring is coming right up. What I do with the small colonies is I watch them grow. I don't combine them with other colonies. If they're queenless, that's a different thing. But if they've got a queen, small brood pattern, we've all had these colonies if you've been keeping bees for a while. Um, I'll get a colony that just never really gets that big through the year. But I like to use them for observation because I like to see what weak performing colonies are doing. And then you get these super colonies, like the ones I have right now with the sensors in them. I have a colony with four boxes on it, so it's a deep and three mediums because they were just so big and I couldn't condense them down. And I thought they were dead because there were no dead bees in the snow. But now that I put a sensor in there and then I pulled the top to put the sensor in to the rapid round feeder that was there. This is what a rapid round feeder looks like. I open this up. And the inner thing is not on for winter time, and this just has the emergency sugar in there. And I took the sensor, I laid it right in here, put this lid on. But when I'm doing that, I look through this hole, and I see a bunch of bees in there. I put my hand over it, and uh, my hand got immediately heated up. So they're in there through churning heat. They're actually alive. The colony looked dead from the outside, and that's my supersized colony. What am I going to do about that? In the springtime, they're already huge. The thermal print on that thing, they're in the second from the top honey super. But it the heat pattern expands through two boxes. So these are medium. So it's a good size heat signature. So here's what's going on. Not only that, well, we'll skip over the, the sensor information, but it is a fantastic tool to know what the temperatures are and the humidity levels are. But what I'm going to do with that colony as soon as spring hits, I'm breaking it up. It is probably going to be 
Right now it's just one big colony. I'm going to take two new colonies off of that. Uh, the other thing is their top performers. Their top performers, not so much in honey production, although they're obviously big. Um, what they are doing is they had low mite counts. So they're really fantastic. Where do they come from? They were one of the colonies that came out of my observation hive, which has the bee weaver queen in it. So she left, I collected her, put her in that. Here we have this giant box. So I'm gonna make a bunch of other splits. How and when would I split? One of the things that I like to look for in the spring in particular, we know that from earlier on in today's discussion, we know that when we see a bunch of pollen coming in that they're brood building. So we know that they'll have a bunch of eggs in there. The other thing is now just because they have eggs, just because they have brood, just because there's thousands of bees in there and it looks like I could split them up, is that enough? What else do I need? I need drones, I need lots of drones. Now here's the thing, just because I see drones coming from those colonies, how is that helpful? Because they're not gonna mate with their own drones, but what I use that for is an indicator. That's an indicator to let me know that if drones are already being produced in this colony here, then some other colonies out there that have made it through winter are also kicking out drones. So I look at several different landing boards. If I start seeing drone numbers out there and they're all taken off, uh, that's a good time to start splitting because we know that they're gonna have to have virgin queens. They're gonna have to complete their flights and everything else. So what do I need to split? I look for the eggs. If there's a bunch of eggs, a bunch of brood, and there will be just based on how it looks right now. So if I have, I'll pull brood frames that have eggs in them in each box. So the original box will no longer have its queen. I'm going to move the queen into a new colony because what did I do then? I satisfied their instinct to reproduce as a superorganism. The queen left her pheromones weakening, but guess what? They have a bunch of, uh, in a perfect world, they would already be building uh, queen cells. But uh, it's enough just that they all have eggs, that I have enough frames of brood. Two good frames of brood would do it for me. And I'll put them all in uh, single deep boxes with solid bottom boards, tiny entrance reducers, inner cover, and of course a rapid round feeder for sugar syrup in spring to help them get going. And uh, that's what I do. And it's called a walk away split. Eggs in every hive. Put the queen in one of the hives that I've created new. They don't have to be put far away from that colony uh, because the nurse bees that are on those frames don't know where they live. They're not leaving. They're not going anywhere. But the farther apart you can put these colonies, the better. And then they're all going to build up on their own. And what's interesting is I don't have very many failures when it comes to walk away splits. So I know there are formulas that people like to follow. I need to pull at least three frames of brood. I need to, you know, overwhelmingly dump the uh, stock out of that original hive because they're the ones with the biggest advantage. They have the best infrastructure. They've got everything. All the resources are there. So they can actually take the hit if they end up with much smaller numbers. Their resources are heavier. So by pulling those uh, brood frames out, starting my new colonies, if you've got better comb, yes, I know, some people don't like that stuff. I'll be sandwiching the brood frames that I pull out that have the eggs and larvae in them. And when I put those in the new hive, they will have better comb on the outskirts of that because that's immediate resources for them without having to build infrastructure. It's already there. So they'll clean up the cells and they'll go right to work on that. That's been done before. I did it last year and it worked fantastic. So walk away splits. That's what I do with strong colonies. And then we'll let them build up. See how they do because the genetics are going to be unknown with the new queens because once they hatch a fly out, they're going to breed with the drones and another 30 days plus down the road, maybe we'll have some new bees emerging in those colonies and we'll be able to see what their attitude is and also what the resistance to mites are going to be. But we also did what? We created a brood break. What happens when there's no new brood while the new queen gets going? Well, the Varroa destructor mites have no place to reproduce. So... That's also part of natural control, making your own splits, controlling what's going on. If you can't have more uh, beehives, more colonies where you live, talk to somebody in your bee club that needs to get started with bees and invite them out, bring their own equipment, and you do that split and move your stuff right into their box and send them home happy. So you reduce your numbers, reduce the propensity to, to swarm, and you've solved your own problem. That's what I would do. Next, Steve Kleinman, Massachusetts. 
I suspect that two hives are dead because I've not seen cleansing flights happening. Don't give up on those yet. Although I don't know what your temperature is, but here where I am, a lot of colonies were not flying at all. Plenty of bees in there. Why weren't they flying? They have plenty of resources. Anyway, cleansing flight's happening. And I'm waiting for a warmish day to perform a post-mortem to determine the cause of death. Let's say they starved to death because they couldn't break cluster. We had a very long period where temperatures were only in the 30s. The 30s here would be warm. Assuming that they were able to seal up cracks between boxes in the fall, assuming that the bottom board is solid, and assuming the entrance has been reduced, that there is no upper entrance and that an insulated top cover was used, would insulation have been effective in allowing them to heat up the interior space to 51 degrees so they can move around and get their stores? I am happy to provide emergency feeding on top, winter if I can get them able to move around to the areas where the stores and not starve out your opinion okay so here's the thing when they're in that cluster and this is what happens this time of year that makes everybody so frustrated your bees are alive they're clustered honey's over here they don't go to it where do they move to consume the honey by the way one of the comments here would the whole space be heated to 51 degrees well according to my sensors that are out there no so here's the thing where are the bees heating the resources that they're consuming? They're in the cluster. So what happens is the cluster of bees moves upwards. That's their natural instinct. They keep moving up. That's why the honey stores, the capped honey that's directly above them is the most beneficial to the bees because it's the honey that they're directly over the top of that gets warmed by the bees because in that cluster that warmth is there, especially if there's brood there. If there's brood there, the center of that cluster is in the 90s. So as they move, the cluster starts to pancake out. Why are they doing that? Because the cluster is moving over food resources and they're pancaking out. They're becoming distorted because this part of the cluster is still stuck over the brood they're making. This is where the number of bees you have in that colony is going to guarantee their success or failure. They're living or dying. Because if they don't have enough bees to stay over those developing pupa and keeping them warm, and enough bees to expand out and get over that uh, stored honey at the same time. If it's a tiny cluster, they start in place. If they're big enough to have both of those duties being performed at the same time, they make it. So they don't heat the whole space. But it is interesting uh, with a sensor up in that cover, because that's what I'm going to look at. The food up there has to be at 51 degrees. This is where this whole discussion comes into play. Where do you put your emergency winter food? Well, the people that put it directly over the brood frames benefit from the brood ultimately migrating as a cluster right up against that food. So the blocks of sugar, the fondant, things like that, they run right up against it solid underneath and then they can feed on it because they collectively warm that surface. So the top side of that would be too cold to eat, but the underside where the cluster is, is warm enough to consume to metabolize. So enough bees is really the key kind of to everything. But so what I get to do is watch the sensors. And when I see that rapid round feeder go up to 51, 52, 53 degrees, what's going on in there? It's not radiant heat from the cluster. It means that the bees have actually migrated in numbers up into that rapid round feeder. So they have enough to leave bees over the valuable brood and enough surplus workers to get up there into that rapid round feeder and heat a spot because then when I see that sensor go up, but it's only 39 degrees outside, they also increase humidity up there too. So these are valuable tools, not terribly accurate, by the way. So like if it says it's 53 degrees up there, it might be 51.5 or something but it shows me that there's activity in that rapid round feeder and that I have enough bees in that colony to do more than one thing at once and preserve heat and heat the resources that they need to consume. So all this empty space around them, this is why oversized colonies going into winter are a bad idea. If you don't have enough bees to occupy the space, to manage and maintain the space and make use of those resources, all that extra space for a small cluster is not beneficial at all. All the food in the world 
is not beneficial at all unless there are enough bees to tend the brood and harvest resources. And then as that brood starts to hatch, they'll start, the queen will be laying eggs further up as they empty those honey cells up above where the brood currently is. She'll be laying her new eggs in there and then the cluster warms them. And as the ones down below that are hatching out, they start to migrate up and catch up with the rest of them. The whole thing moves up. That thing moves at a millimeter per day based on studies that have been done. So, let's see. I can't tell you if they're gonna make it. They can tell you that that's what they do, and it's always the tiny clusters that die out, that end up soaking wet and everything else because they can no longer maintain the space they're in. Next is from Mike Blair. If you want to create a new hive, and you have already two colonies. Can you crossbreed two somehow? Like taking a queen cell from one and somehow getting it to breed with a drone from the other? If so, how would this be done? Or can you direct me to a source of information on this? Thank you. And this is from Mike Blair. I understand why people think that that might be something you could do. Uh, this falls under the same idea that you know the bees in the same apiary somehow are going to mate with one another like you make a queen she's going to mate with these bees over here it generally doesn't happen that way they when that queen hatches out uh, once she's mature enough to fly and do her mating flights she's headed out she's not going to want to breed with anybody nearby could you do it you got stock over here that's outstanding stock over here that's outstanding you want to do the two the only way that that's working is Artificial insemination. That is a very sophisticated method, a very sophisticated system done by people who are making uh, breeder queens, for example, that uh, are of known genetics. This isn't something a backyard beekeeper can do. I can see why people could think that that might work. It just doesn't. The queen takes off. She doesn't pay attention to anybody and off she goes. You also cannot. Somebody else wanted to do this. They wanted to take a queen, put her in a cage, an unmated queen that hatches out, and then put drones in with her and get them to mate with her. For some reason, that just doesn't work. I mean, I understand the effort, but here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to be in the business of selecting the drones that are going to mate with your queen. You want the drones to make that decision and the queen to make that decision, and you want your fastest flying, healthiest killer drones on earth to mate with that queen. Well, what about these hives that are dying out that have laying workers? They're making drones. What about those drones? Those drones are undersized, under horsepowered, and not as proficient at mating as those that are coming from healthy stock where the drones are actually produced from the queens. So there's that. So the only way to actually force them to mate, if that's what you're trying to do, that is uh, artificial insemination. And those labs are pretty sophisticated. There are lots of videos on it. Next is from P. Grace. I have a question concerning propolis. I am starting with my first hives this spring. I'd like to rough up the inside of the hives, starting with Langstroth. We'll also have two lands and four Slovenian hives in the next year or two. So that the bees will develop that propolis envelope. How do I do this? What kind of tools would be good to rough up the inside of the boxes? That's a really good question. Uh, and here's the thing. I source rough cut lumber. And where do I put it? I put that uh, on my feeder shims. And they do propolize it really well. They don't propolize so much the smooth surface of the interior of the boxes. For those of you who are wondering what the heck are we talking about, propolis is the bee's way of sealing up rough surfaces in the hive, closing up crevices, and uh, creating antibacterial protection for the colony. So it is, in essence, it is the immune system of the colony and can actually be effective against any number of pathogens that your hive gets exposed to. And so it is a huge benefit to the bees. That's why there's this interest in encouraging the bees to develop it. Marla Spivak has done a pile of research and has ongoing research uh, as to exactly how to induce the bees to produce more propolis on the interior surface. And plus the bees continually replenish and refresh that during the warm seasons of the year. So 
It is an antibacterial material that benefits the bees and it's been measured, studied, supported, and uh, it does work. So what can you do? Look for propolis traps. Propolis traps kind of look like thin uh, queen excluders. They're designed to stick to the interior surfaces of your hive and when the bees encounter that surface, they fill it with propolis and therefore increase the health and well-being inside your colony. So look for those traps. Here's what has not worked very well. Taking saw blades and cutting diagonals across the surface of the wood. Remember, anything that you're doing to rough up and score the interior surface of the wood, you're also damaging and cutting into the thickness of the wood. Why not add to that thickness a little bit? Uh, those propolis traps are not that large uh, thickness wise so I don't think they're going to impede although I've not used them myself all I've done is read the literature but uh, you can get those put them on the inside surfaces do a test see how they do definitely now if you had to pick where would you put those surfaces I would do the interior upper box first so the top interior surface that's where I put them first and then go down the side walls from there, upper boxes and so on. But that's it. Look up Marla Spivak. I think uh, there's lots of lectures that she's done. And some of those are available on YouTube. And uh, that's it. You can find out more there. But that's what I would do if I really wanted to encourage them over trying to rough it up. Because that has not turned out to work very well. Bob McQueen, Sterling, Kentucky. Hi Fred, like you, I am finishing my first year with a horizontal hive and I'm very impressed. However, I'm concerned about treating for Varroa. I plan on oxalic acid vapor around next December time frame, but I am interested in what your thoughts are for spring treatment in a horizontal hive with the label directions for most treatments referring to the large entrance of the Langstroth hive. What would you recommend or plan to use for spring treatment for the horizontal hive with the new release of OAV with Honey Supers. Thank you. Um, well, I'm hoping not to have to treat, but if I do, the colonies that I have that show up with high mite numbers and the horizontal Langstroth hive, I'm going to be using uh, Formic Pro this year because I'm in a cool area. If you're in a really hot area, I don't know how hot Kentucky, Sterling, Kentucky, or Mount Sterling, Kentucky gets. Uh, but if it's between 50 and 80, the efficacy is really good for Formic Pro. And you can put that in there with your Honey Supers on and everything else. It has an advantage over oxalic acid vaporization. What's the advantage? It treats right through those capped pupa, which oxalic acid vaporization does not. So here's my plan. And again, Every beekeeper is going to come up with their own method, and it may not be the same everywhere in the country because you deal with different temperature extremes. If you're going to get temperatures way over 80 degrees, I wouldn't use Formic. I would use something else. Oxalic acid could be used, and it works really well in the horizontal hive because it just goes everywhere. And uh, But you have to do a series, and you have to do follow-up mite counts to verify how effective that was, now, how well it worked. But uh, I also use the ProVap 110, ProVap, ProVape, whatever you want to call it. I have a friend that actually made his own version of that, by the way, and he did it very inexpensively, but he's a genius and I'm not. So he made his own version of the ProVape, which, by the way, looks better than that. And he's not going to be selling them, of course. But the parameters were better and everything else. But here's the thing. You just cut a quarter inch hole and put that uh, into the hive and close up your front entrance and you can introduce your oxalic acid vaporization that way it is super handy and super efficient uh, the difference is of course you have to do several series of them which if you use the uh, formic pro you can either use the two uh, pack method in one treatment or you can extend the treatment and do two single pack treatments which tends to show marginally better results but it's temperature constrained as far as to make sure it gets max effectiveness. No colder than 50, no hotter than 80 for optimum results. But uh, if I was going heavy into beekeeping and I knew that I that it was going to be something I'm going to do for a long time and I wanted to treat with oxalic acid vaporization, which is what got me into one of the best years ever since I've been keeping bees, 
uh, I get the Pro Vape because that thing just makes everything so easy. You have to be within range of an outlet. So I have really long extension cords. But that's what I use, backup plan. And that's why my horizontal hive configuration, my long Langstroth hive over the tops of those frames, there's a space and then there are the cover boards above that. That space is perfectly suited for putting in something like uh, Formic Pro packs, which would go right over the brood. So either way, that's what I plan to do. Let's see, do, do, do. I'm just gonna skip over that one, I think. Oh, we're at the end. Guess what? How quick did that go? Hopefully you didn't fall asleep yet. I know that some people, this is fluff, so all the questions are done. Now we're just gonna talk, right? And remember that I said that I was going to have a giveaway because this is my 100th uh, Q&A video, which everybody wants that to be special for some reason. So here's what goes on. Uh, what can we talk about? The giveaway is going to be this. I'm going to make you look something up and you're going to have to write it. If you want the giveaway, the giveaway is going to be a care package from me. What's going to be in it? Well, it's going to have a book called A Field Guide to Honeybees and Their Maladies. It's going to have a custom coffee cup. This isn't it. And it's going to be a commemorative coffee cup of my 100th episode. And uh, it's also going to have one of these fancy hive gates in it. If you don't know what that is, you need to go to my website, thewaytobe.org, and look at the hive gate study. That's going to be in the kit and other things that I won't even tell you about. But you're going to have to work for it. So here's what's going to happen. Get your pens out because I know some of you are going to try to do this right away. It's the first person that posts the correct answer in the comments section down below. Guess what my first rule is? Your correct answer cannot have been edited. Because I'm on to those people that put up an answer right away and then do the research and come back later to make sure that they were the first one to post the correct answer and then it shows up as edited, but it's still, they got primacy in there. It's not going to work. It cannot be an edited answer. This is what you have to do. You have to prove your scientific source for this information and give me that link. You have to tell me and everyone that reads it how many lenses are in the eye of a worker bee, Apis mellifera, how many lenses are in the eye of the drone, how many lenses are in the eye of the queen. So I need the numbers for a single eye and for both eyes together. It's not that hard. And the last thing that you have to answer is, are all of the lenses on the eyes of the drone, which is the male bee, are they the same size all over the surface of the eye or not? That's the whole thing. The first person to post the correct answer Number of lenses in the eyes of the worker, number of lenses in the eyes of the drone, number of lenses in the eyes of the queen, and are the eye lenses all the same size? And cite your scientific source. First person to post that answer is going to get the care package from me that's going to have lots of cool stuff in it, and that's how I'm going to celebrate my 100th episode of Questions and Answers for Backyard Beekeepers. Thanks for joining me today, and good luck to all of you, and I look forward to seeing that well-researched answer. Have a great weekend.